I'm David Scobie. Uh, I'm the executive dean of the New School for Public Engagement, a division uh, here at the New School. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to, to welcome and to introduce uh, John Walensky uh, this morning. Uh, John is a distinguished scholar of education, of educational and, technolo and, and informational technology and literacy. Uh, he taught for many years at the University of British uh, Columbia uh, and is now at the Stanford University School of Education, although he still directs uh, at UBC the uh, Public Knowledge Project. He's the author of many, many books, and I think most relevantly, a recent series of books about public access to scholarship and knowledge, including If Only We Knew, Increasing the Public Value of Social Science Research, and The Access Principle, The Case for Open Access to Research and Scholarship. He'll be talking to us today uh, about various visions of intellectual property that do or should uh, guide access to, to learning and to scholarship. Uh, and immediately afterwards, we'll have a, a workshop, and, and I know he wants a very uh, robust uh, give and take and discussion about how we help to build regimes of open access here at the New School. So John, welcome. Thank you very much, David. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, um, a chance to talk about open access, uh, part of a large event around mobility. And I guess if I was going to do a connection uh, with my talk and then the larger theme, I would say no knowledge mobilization is our focus. That is, how can we move knowledge uh, further into the public sphere? So as David mentioned, this is a, a kind of two-part presentation. Um, we're going to start with the theory. Um, I'll try to be a little practical, but then there's a workshop afterwards at 11 o'clock about the practicalities of how we, in fact, make the work we do in universities uh, a public resource um, around legal issues, economic issues, around how do we mobilize students and faculty, what forms do publishing take, what does it mean for reputation, um, careers, and all of those really important uh, factors. But first, we need a little theory. Um, and a little theory grounded in practice. So I am a school teacher um, by trade, uh, Canadian. I don't know if you recognize the accent a little thick. Uh, Canadian school teacher by trade, and I became a professor of education. Um, and as a professor of education, I felt it was my duty and my delight to excite teachers, student teachers, and, and experienced teachers in what research could bring. Uh, what research had found, what we knew about classrooms, about how children learned. Uh, but then I ran into this contradiction. I would get the student teachers and the experienced teachers who came back for a master's degree excited about the research, thinking that there were things to learn about their own practices, dilemmas that they were facing with their kids and their classrooms. And they would learn some, a few things, but then when they graduated, there was this strange ceremony where we would take their library cards as they crossed the stage. I don't know if you did this at your institution. We would take their library cards as they crossed the stage with these giant scissors, and we would cut those library cards and say, no more research for you. You've graduated. Whatever you've got now, go forth, be fruitful, and multiply, divide, whatever. And there was a kind of contradiction for me. That didn't quite make sense. There was something almost hypocritical about saying this knowledge is so important for improving your practice that once you leave this institution, you can have no more access to it. We even did an experiment with the local newspaper in Vancouver, where we combined with the newspaper, they were covering technology and education, and we were going to provide the research for the public. We were going to try to connect journalism and scholarship. And the Journalists were great about it. They wouldn't tell us till midnight what they were going to write about the next day. I wasn't used to the kind of deadlines that journalists face. Uh, but we were OK with that, because we had graduate students who were up that late anyway. Certainly, I wasn't. And what we found was that we could do part of it. We could bring the abstracts to the public, but the library wouldn't let us share the research. And at that point, I decided I needed to change my direction. I needed to pause in the way that I was exhorting teachers to get excited about research and do something about my own work, something about the whole public position of the university, something about repositioning what we were doing in terms of the public knowledge that we were producing, in terms of the interest in research and scholarship, 
in terms of the work we were doing. So I want to focus today on one particular aspect. Trevor and I were talking earlier about all of the possible changes in terms of education today, everything from iTunes U uh, through to YouTube channels to courses online. And I just want to focus on one aspect, and that is the research and scholarship that we produce and on the basis on which it can be shared. Now, this was the stories I'm telling you are from 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, when I started the Public Knowledge Project. And in those 12 years, and I called it a project. I have to tell you this part because I'm a little embarrassed. Uh, I called it a project because I thought it would be short term. Like it was just I was going to take a few months, maybe a year, out of my work on literacy and language and literature with students and teachers. I was going to take some time out and just clean up this embarrassment. Research is not available to the public, to teachers, to professionals. Um, so now it's 12 years later, and I'm kind of feeling a little sheepish. I haven't moved all of the literature in the world into the public domain. Some of it is still quite locked up and quite hard to get at, and you have to have a library card from a good institution in order to see it. So this project is, is ongoing. And at the 12th year, after a, a, a dozen years at this, uh, I came to a realization that maybe there's something wrong about my assumption. Why is it? Why is it that I even think that this research should be publicly available? Where did I get this idea, and why is it so hard to convince my colleagues, my deans and, and provosts and chancellors, the publishers and scholarly societies that I work with, why is it so hard to convince them? What, is there something wrong with this idea? And so I tried to figure out a way, and this is why I want to, I want to address this at the beginning, um, because it hasn't worked, the assumption that this knowledge should be free. I haven't convinced all that many people. I can tell you exactly how many, what percentage of the literature. Maybe I should do that for a moment. My success, and the success of all of us working in this area. We call it open access, referring to the literature, the research, particularly the journal literature. Uh, we call it open access. And what that means is you can find it on the web and click on it and read it. Whether you have a library card, whether you graduated a decade ago, whether you've ever been to university, that literature you can click on and you can read. Now, if you're working in a university, you may not even appreciate because you come in through your library, you think it's all free, many students think it is until they graduate. So in the dozen years that many of us have been working on open access, we can now claim that 20% of the literature that is published in the very best journals or the very worst, where I actually publish, worst journals, 20% of the literature that is published each year is open access. You can find it on the web. You go into Google Scholar and it will say in square brackets, PDF. Have you ever seen that in Google Scholar? PDF, it's, they put it off in the margin. Now, the right margin, I argued it should be in the left margin. I thought it was politically inappropriate that they put it in the <laughs> right margin. But they felt that there was a kind of irony about that. So they won the margin wars. So Google Scholar now indicates work that is freely available. Even though if you click on the left side, you'll get to the journal where you need a password. For 20% of the literature, somewhere, there's a free copy. There's six or 7,000, I think actually closer to nine or 10,000 journals that publish open access. Everything they publish is immediately available. And in the workshop, I'll talk more about the kind of practicalities of that. But lots of people are putting their work in repositories. Lots of people are putting their work on their own website. And that's adding up to 20% of the literature. Now, that's important. Ten years ago, it wasn't 20%, it was 2% probably. So that means that a parent that goes into the web, goes onto the web, a parent who has a sick child, a parent who is concerned about the treatment that child is getting, and that parent goes into PubMed, which is the best life sciences index, because the doctor advised her to do that, she has a one in five chance of finding an article that she can look at because of the open access movement. Now, where do I get this idea that it should be a five out of five chance that she'll be able to see that article and print it out and share it with the doctor? 
And they're very amusing stories about doctors being faced with research from patients. Uh, they're getting more positive, I have to say. I don't know if any of you tried this 10 years ago. Uh, the reception was not overwhelmingly warm from physicians. Um, now they're very interested, especially if you print out in color. Like this is a really just a little tip for bringing in medical research to physicians. They, it's apparently important for the diagram, the figures, and, and everything, things like that. So this is the situation. We have 20% of the literature. I'm very concerned. Many people are very concerned about how we can increase that. But we need to step back for a moment, I'm arguing, and, and think about the theory. So I want to do that a bit. I want to talk about where we get this idea in the first place. Okay? And I want to introduce a, a legal and historical perspective, because actually, there is a legal basis for thinking that the literature published by the university should be freely available. There's a historical and a philosophical basis as well. And it has to do with, with what I'm calling the intellectual properties of learning. OK, so it's still intellectual property, very much. But I want to argue with you for the next few minutes about the, a distinct class of intellectual property a distinct class of IP that is defined by its association with learning. Now, I'm using learning in a broad but kind of old-fashioned sense. I mean learning in terms of students coming to class, but I mean learning in terms of the learned. That is the work that goes on in scholarship. That is what it is to be a researcher is to be a learner. You're trying to discover, find out something new. You're reading papers. You're trying to acquire knowledge that will help you produce something new. So how is it that we're thinking about the intellectual properties of learning as distinct? Because right now, right now, the intellectual properties of a research article and of Lady Gaga's songs are the same. The courts treat them the same. Justin Timberlake, article in Nature, the same. Now, I want to give you some precedents. I want to establish that, in fact, legally, there is some confusion. There is a basis. Let me put it that way, not a confusion. There is a wedge that can pull them apart. The research article, Justin and Lady. Okay. But before that, I want to give a foundation in John Locke. I want to take you back to a philosophical position about property. I want us to understand the nature of property for a moment, OK? I need to do this now before it gets any later in the morning. Because I know epistemology and philosophy is, can be difficult. Anything after 11 I, is hopeless. I don't know if you've taught philosophy. So if you get them, are the coffee still with you? OK, so let's, we won't go too long or too deep in this. John Locke. Uh, I've been teaching at, at Stanford for this is my fifth year. So it's, it, it's been a pleasure and, and again, a duty um, to lecture Americans about their own country. It's a, it's a treat, actually. <laughs> It's something that every Canadian lines up to do. <laughs> Peter Jennings, uh, Neil Young, um, Joni Mitchell. Uh, so from my perspective, I want to borrow an idea that John Locke is a founding father here for a moment. I want to com conflate a few philosophical positions around Jefferson and things like that to say that property is pretty important in this country. Can I say that at least? Yes. Property is a value in this country. And the great philosopher of property is John Locke. In a small chapter called Of Property, in the two treatises that he would never admit until his deathbed that he had written, it was that revolutionary attract. In the two treatises, in the second treatise in his chapter on property, he provides a justification. He feels it's important to explain why is there a right to property. Now, in this country, you don't need to do that. When you enter the border as a Canadian, you hand your passport to the agent. He looks you in the eye and says, property? You say, yes. <laughs> Sacrosanct, sovereign, unquestionable. He gives you the thumb in. But Locke felt there needed to be a basis. He was directing, Locke was directing his attack or his justification against the divine right of kings, that all of property was given to the king, starting with Adam, in fact, and was handed down. 
So you can see immediately the kind of declaration of independence having an aspect of this property claim. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of estates, the protection of estates was John Locke. Jefferson tried that out in a focus group, it didn't go. Pursuit of happiness seemed to be, you know, had a much pos more positive rating. Um, but it was Locke at, at the forefront of, of the declaration. So this idea then that, that, that property needs to be justified. Locke starts with a notion that is critical to us, a biblical, he talks about it as biblical and, and reasonable in, in terms of natural law, that the world was given to us in common, in the beginning. And he actually uses America as, as an example in some unfortunate ways, but we don't need to get into that. In the beginning, the world was given to us in common. How is it that anybody can make a claim against that? What basis do you start separating things out when the world is obviously, in terms of natural law, given to everyone equally in common? Well, Locke says survival. Locke says we have a property in our own bodies. Okay, a very important principle. Our bodies ourselves, ring a bell to anybody? Right, totally Lockean. Proto-feminist Lockean, Boston Health Collective Lockean. That's the first one. So if I pull an apple off a tree, if I gather up some almonds, however I dry some raisins, very nice trail mix, all of that is justified from taking from the commons. Why? Because it's necessary for survival and it leaves enough for everybody else. There's enough left over. Second principle for Locke was labor. If you invest labor, if you work on something, on, on raising some, improving the apples, let us say, gathering the apples, then you have justified an ownership. You have a claim by your investment of labor. That distinguishes it. But if there's any waste, you've nullified that. Okay, now you have to hold these principles in your head for a few minutes. Do we need a review? We've got survival, we've got labor. Then he starts to get tricky. Oh, and don't forget waste. Then he starts to get a little tricky. Because how is it that somebody could enclose a property which so clearly is necessary? How is it that we could enclose a property and keep everybody off and justify that? Forget the apple tree, the low-hanging fruit, as we say in the Silicon Valley. Locke says, if you enclose that property and increase its value by cultivating that land so that its fruits, as it were, increase by a hundredfold, that's a figure he actually uses, then you've justified it. If you let that go to waste, you've lost your claim on property. But if you increase the productivity of that acre a hundredfold, and whether you sell that or distribute it by any means, you've justified that property. So this is critical for us, that there isn't wastage, that you increase the value and that labor invested is recognized. Now Locke does not talk about intellectual property. Locke talks about property, property. Dirty, messy earth, property, property. But within five years of his death, in 17, D dies in 1705, 1704 actually, I think, maybe 1705, Google, Wikipedia, in 1710, there's the first, what is considered to be the first copyright act. It wasn't called that. It's called the Statute of Anne, 1710. But it embodies a principle of intellectual property because it recognizes the rights of the author. But let me just go over this one more time so we see the connections here. So does intellectual property have an investment of labor? Does it increase the value of something? I hope so. Not really? You've been reading bad papers. You've got to be more selective. It should increase the value of it, OK? Is there wastage? Well, let's, let's try it this way. Let's think about it in the context of, of, of the academy here. When I take books out of the library, what I do is I remove them from circulation. I almost fence them in. I put them in my office, and I lock them up. 
So I, the, the library is given to us in common. Let's imagine the world of the university here, distributed across the blocks of New York City, as much as on a green, grassy campus. I take the work out of the library, and I invest my labor in it. I make notes, and I create a new work. And as soon as I create a new work, I have justified, right? I have justified that removal from the commons because I've created something of value. You're looking at me askance. I can do this. You know that. I have tenure. <laughs> I am able to take books out of the library. You're still not. <laughs> I am able to take books out of the library, work and keep anyone else from using them for four to six weeks with renewals, and then increase that value by producing a new work. But that new work only has value if it goes back into the commons. It only has value if others are able to use it just like I used their work. The circulation, the mobility of knowledge is critical to its value in a Lockean sense. But the difference is between Lady Gaga and me, many differences, but the one I want to focus on right now <laughs> is not sartorial, but the one I want to focus on right now is this idea that the only time I increase value is when my work circulates. The more widely it circulate, circulates, the greater its value. If it circulates universally, it reaches its maximum. A value in two senses that doesn't apply to Lady Gaga. One is it gets critically reviewed. It stands up to a test. It is analyzed. And then I know its value. And the other is there are no barriers. If Lady Gaga's songs are freely circulating, if her concerts are open to the public with no restrictions, her value goes down. She has no revenue source, no income. I have an income from the university, and my work and the value of my work intellectually depends on that circulation. Now, I want to go through, this is just the beginning. I want to set a number of these positions around this distinction. Okay, and again, it's a distinction around the intellectual properties of learning associated with the university and those of the rest of intellectual property, whether it is music or television or media. And it's partly based on the economics of my own position. That is, I am hired as a university professor on the basis of my reputation. I get a return on how widely my work circulates. Anything that restricts that circulation restricts my reputation, unnecessarily hurts me. And my status, my ability to get a job, my ability to get two windows in my office. Can we hold that for a second? Let's see how it played out in history. I'll come back to it. So how does this play out in history, this weird kind of notion? Now, I, I want to go two directions very briefly. We've got Locke in the middle. Out of Locke comes the United States of America, the French Revolution, a few minor incidentals, knock-on effects, we might call them, from Locke's theory of property. But the work I've been doing for the last year or so, and I don't want to spend, I, I really want to go forward, but let me just step back for a second because I've been working on it so intensely, is on monasteries. Because Locke was a principle, and I needed a historical example. Locke said the world is held in common. And out of that were these divisions, and it was kind of hypothetical. It was kind of biblical. But in the monasteries, I've been able to find some principles. I've been able to find a communal sharing of property. And in the monasteries, where everything was shared, from the book to the pen to the tablet, they had tablets. I was pretty impressed. Everything was shared, but there was a strange anti-intellectual attitude in the monasteries because it was all about salvation. Aristotle and Plato were nothing but pagans. Learning was a way, a source of vanity. And so the, there, there had to be an overcoming. And in the monasteries, with the sharing of property, they had to establish, in order to be a scholarly monk, you had to establish its value. What does it give to the community? Otherwise, 
You were risking trafficking in pagan philosophy, vanity, and pride, and were condemned out of court, or out of the cloister, I should say. So just consider that for a moment, because I, I want us to go forward. But there are historical precedents. I want to talk about from, from Locke's and death in 1710, this, this, this first copyright act. In 1710, the Statute of Anne recognizes for the first time the right of an author. Prior to that, it was really the king. It was really the king who granted permission. The stationer's company said, you can publish. I trust you. You can no longer publish because you have been publishing treasonous, blasphemous work. And, and so the, the author really played no part in it. After 1710, after that kind of democratic revolution, 1688, the glorious revolution, there was a recognition that authors needed to be protected. Their economic rights needed to be protected. And in that recognition of authors' rights, largely printers behind the authors, and there's still lots of controversy about that, but it also contained something else. It also contained a number of clauses that protected the universities. It contained clauses that said, of every book published, one copy should be deposited in the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, which were considered to be public libraries. The universities in, in, in Scotland were to get one copy. There had to be a deposit, a contribution. You could sell as many as you wanted as long as you deposited a copy with the universities. That was a legal recognition of a separate economic domain. That recognized that a book deposited in the commons of the university library created value for that society. Remember Locke's principle? It created a public value. Now they also granted the university presidents, or not, yeah, they principals probably at that point, maybe chancellors, certain privileges, which are, I just find incidentally amusing. One was they could call up booksellers if they were overcharging. I just, it's just, I find it a kind of fantasy, this idea of calling up Elsevier, Taylor and Francis Springer, calling them into your office and saying, according to the Statute of Anne, 1710, never been revoked, I have the right to call you before me and demand an explanation of why the prices are as they are. Because you are, in fact, working against the public good, as defined by Queen Anne, who was no great liberal, believe me, but in this was generous. Finally, one more privilege was granted to the universities, probably the most powerful, and that was their right to publish that while the right to publish was highly controlled by the king or the queen, in the case of Anne, for political reasons, for religious reasons, they recognized an exception that something was going on in the universities that needed to be protected, that needed a state of privilege because of the value being produced. And in that act of Anne, we have a distinct class of intellectual property from the very get-go. From the first English language copyright act, there is a recognition of a distinct class of intellectual property. The act doesn't have a title, but its first words are for the advancement of the richness of Lady Gaga and Justin Timberlake. No, no, sorry. Uh, excuse me. For the Advancement of learning. Okay? First copyright act. Not the Mickey Mouse Protection Act, but for the advancement of learning. Now, where else does this exist? And is this just a British law? Where in American law does this exist? Let me give you a, a few examples of the traces of this. Now, I want to present to you this, this double-sided aspect. That is, there is no court-based, sorry, there is and there isn't. Let me put it that way. If I can confuse you anymore, let me know. There is and there isn't a legal basis by which we can distinguish Justin Timberlake's songs and his rights to those songs 
and the work that we publish in social research or any other journal. There is and there isn't. Let me start with the fact that there is a distinction. Statute of Anne, UK, did not apply in the United States. Big controversies with copyright in the United States. Charles Dickens comes over in the 19th century, leaves a broken man after he discovers that everything he's ever published is circulating here with no copyright returns to him, if you know the story of, of Dickens. And he gets lambasted in the papers for whining about his royalties. And Dickens was not a whiner, please. But let me stay with, with, with the American legal situation. Let me start with, with, with a simple one, fair use. In this country, we call it fair dealing, by the way, in Canada. Fair, it's a poker association. But fair use in the United States is part of the copyright law. Fair use says there are certain circumstances in this country where copyright does not hold, where we can suspend copyright in the name of fair. It's lovely. Fair use. And the key there, the most obvious one, the best protected, and there are many of them, but they're very ill-defined, is for private study. You are allowed in a library to take the book you're reading, if there's an important section in that book, not the whole book, and go to the photocopier and copy that section without violating, without even being concerned, because you are, your rights are protected. Private study is protected against the commercial onslaught against the sacredness of property because private study is seen as a public good. The New York Public Library is proud of the number of people who have sat at its beautiful tables in the Rose Room and created wonderful intellectual property. My favorite is the Polaroid, the land camera, right? It's the big claim. The British Library has Karl Marx the New York Public Library, instant pictures. Right there from the tables, 30 seconds to the picture. So fair use protects in one level. It doesn't protect a teacher's right, and this is interesting in education. In fact, this is the big difference between Canada and the United States. It doesn't protect in either country my right to photocopy class sets of articles and hand them out. That undermines the publisher's business. And fair use does not, is not in the business of undermining people's business. Fair use protects property with certain exceptions. But in the United States, there has been established a spontaneous teaching exception that I find delightful and is not present in Canada. The spontaneous teaching exception, it's not written into the, but it has been defended in the courts, not written into the, the Fair Use Act. Fair use, I should point out to you, fair use does not define the number of words you can photocopy. A number of, it does not define the number of words you can cite in a scholarly article, but it defines, def, excuse me, it defends the right. And so you, some of us have discovered this. You can take a verse of, of Bob Dylan uh, and pay a lot of money for it. You can take uh, 500, 600 words of John Barth and not pay anything. And so these are all decisions that, that, have not, that are resolved case by case when they come up. But the principle of private study is one that doesn't come up. The principle of how much you can use fairly in scholarly work and other places, and in, in, excuse me, in published work, does come up. So there is a, a sense in which there, the, the, there is a protection. But the Spontaneous Teaching Act, has tips, no, it's not an act, Spontaneous Teaching Protection is that as a teacher, if I see a great article in the New York Times in the morning, I tear it out of the paper, I rush in, I want to share it with my class. It's absolutely critical. There's been a breakthrough in the Occupy Wall Street. One of the prayers has levitated one of the buildings. I don't know what has happened. Something has happened, and I can share that with my class. That is protected, has been protected repeatedly. What I can't do is use it the next year. That's not spontaneous. Or every year afterwards, as I tend to do. That's not spontaneous. If I put it on the course syllabus, and hand it out to students, they don't think that's spontaneous. It's so unfair. But they're right. It's not spontaneous. It has to be spontaneous. The poetry I teach, if I read the poem in the morning and tear it out, no, not tear it out, caref carefully bring the book of poetry to class, photocopy it, use it with the class, 
share with them the experience I had just hours before, that's protected. There's a recognition that that kind of spontaneous learning is something of value. Create something of such value that it can interfere with, it can interrupt, if only for a moment, the regime of property. The regime of property rights. Let me give you some other examples. Let's move away from fair use and for a moment. Let's take the, the academic or the teaching instance. Exception, actually it's called. It's called. Sometimes called the teaching exception, sometimes called the academic exception. This is the rights of teachers to their own intellectual property. I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you happen to work for Google, you sign an agreement with Google that all of the intellectual property you produce, whether it's on the special Google shuttle that takes you to work each day with Wi-Fi, San Francisco to Mountain View, I don't know about the New York office, or you produce it in that cafeteria where there are no bills, the food is free. All of that intellectual property belongs to them. What about at the university? Cafeterias aren't free, first. Secondly, as a student or as a teacher, the intellectual property is mine by default. I am entrusted with that intellectual property. I am seen to be creating something of value that needs to be independent from the institution because it is producing a public good, because I have been entrusted with that. Now, forget the fact that I sign it over to a commercial publisher as quickly as I can. I just got accepted by the Nature Group. I couldn't wait to sign. Don't send it to me. I'll rush right over and sign it. Forget that part. Think about how we have been entrusted with a responsibility because we are seen to be involved in the production of something of value in the production of a public good. And see that within American law, in which property has a certain status, I don't know if you've noticed, that exceptions are being created around a distinct class of goods. And that class of goods are associated with learning. Now, a professor may want to publish a novel, may want to create a, think of Cornell West, may want to create a rap record, may want to produce intellectual property that is not part of the domain of learning, per se, but is part of the, that other world, the world beyond learning. That's fine. What I'm saying is if a professor or a student wants to publish a work within the scholarly domain, for which they don't receive any remuneration, for which they have a responsibility that has been entrusted to them, a responsibility based on that academic exception that allows them to retain the copyright, they need to think twice, or momentary pause, before they sign that copyright transfer forever in perpetuity. Though it's not, it's only 70 years after you die, or 90 years for the corporation that owns it. Because when they turn it over, when they close off access to it, they are actually not just hurting, not just undermining that public trust. They're hurting their own interests. Copyright law in the United States is based on two parties. One of them, it's always difficult, this, this notion of the creator. I think it confuses things a little bit. With George Bush, it was even more confused, I think. But now it's still a little bit confused, with the author. Let's call it the author. It protects two parties, the author and the public. It protects the author because the author should have some rights over it, but it protects the public because they, it doesn't go on in perpetuity. Seventy years after the death, unless you're Walt Disney, seventy years after the death, that work becomes public. Anyone can use it. Everyone has a right to it. Charles Dickens' work can be published by anyone at this point. And so the public, and many times the publishers have argued, and in the United States has led the world in extending those rights. When it started, it was 14 years. When Jefferson first instituted the act for the promotion of the sciences and arts, it was 14 years the author had a right. Now it's 70 years after their death. And Mickey Mouse does play in that history, as does Sonny Bono. But 
I don't want to get into that part of it. I just want to just suggest to you how the, these properties work. I want to make sure I didn't miss any other of these exceptions. Just let me consult my notes for a moment here. Ah, uh, yes. Two more. Patents. Let me deal with patents for a moment. Patents are a different kettle of fish. Patent licenses are 20, 30 years. Patents difficult to get. Patent exposes property, but protects it at the same time. You know the story, Coca-Cola, no patents, because they didn't want to share their secret. They didn't want it ever to be made public. Right? Where some people are still looking for it. But so patents are a different regime. They are a very strong form of protection. Um, you notice that in the last few years, the defense of patenting Motorola was bought by Google for its patents. Thousands of patents. IBM has been making its patents public, turning its software into open source software. So the patent struggles in this country are very interesting, going in two directions. Very protective, defensive, people buying patents. Three directions, really. There are companies that only own patents for the right to sue around those patents. And the third is, is this IBM, to its credit, this, this sharing, this opening of public access. Patents have only one exception. There's only one time when the regime of patent protection is suspended, and that is for research. The only time you can use a patented process and not apply for a license is if you are using that patent, patented process in a research project, in a research experiment, I guess would have to be the case. Again. American law recognizing that there is a distinct regime, a distinct separate category around the intellectual property rights involved in learning. The final one, the most obvious one, I can't believe I forgot. This is how I've been at Stanford too long, I think this is the case, because I forgot about the tax status. And it's actually come up into, uh, Senator Grassley has been uh, raising questions uh, about this. So institutions like the New School, Stanford, other institutions have a special tax status, tax exemption, in fact. Its endowment, and again, I appreciate there's a difference, but its endowment is protected in terms of its earnings and protected in terms of its gifts. People in the, pub, excuse me, people in the public can take a big whack of money that normally would contribute to taxes and give it to the new school, and I hope they do. I've been asked to say that. <laughs> and I hope you do, because you will be tax exempt. You will remove that money from the democratic process of elected officials deciding where it should go, and you can decide, as a benefactor, that it will go to the new school, because, and Senator Grassley has been, is it Senator? Has been objecting to this or at least challenging it, because it contributes to the public good. Because the value of that investment is considered to be unquestionably, without anyone else having to judge, a contribution to the public good. And so that the intellectual properties, the intellectual properties that are produced within this institution, among the faculty and the students of the new school, are considered at multiple points to be a public good with a distinct intellectual property status that we almost immediately forget to honor, forget to recognize, forget exists. And so my whole case for open access, my whole argument that we need to think about the ways and means of sharing the work of the new school and of all of the other institutions that we represent is based on this principle that is already part of our history, part of the philosophy governing this country. If you can say that. And part of a practice that represents 20% of the literature at this point, wherever it is published, whether it is in Nature, the New England Journal of Medicine, social research. So this idea that open access has a basis 
has a set of legal precedents that are confused and lost, that don't congeal around a single concept, that don't form a social movement, if you like, around our responsibilities for the literature, around our responsibilities for this aspect, that is, the work that we publish. I want to draw it to a close there, open it up for a few questions, and do ask about the monastery. No, no, you don't have to ask about the monasteries. I'm still working on that part, but I'm very excited about it. Okay, thank you very much.